The disturbing trend of illicit student-teacher relationships continues as a Mississippi teacher is charged with sending explicit photos to a student. I think some people are getting into the job to be predators. This is 27-year-old Emily Swinkowski, a one-time art teacher at Water Valley High School, about two hours north of Jackson. Swinkowski resigned from her position and turned herself over to police on Monday after a weeks-long investigation into her alleged relationship with a student. Swinkowski is now accused of sending explicit photos to a 16-year-old student. To make sense of the case, we sat down with former CIA officer and FBI agent Tracy Walder. I, I do wonder if part of it to them is this excitement um, of having that kind of power over an individual, which is pretty gross. Um, but obviously I've never been in tune with their brains. On top of her credentials with both the CIA and FBI, Walder also added the role of teacher to her resume. She says some predators may specifically choose a teaching profession to target young and defenseless children. I mean, as a teacher, I've taught single sex all girls, but then I've also taught mixed gender. I even teach college and it has never occurred to me to do something like that, literally ever. I, I think that it's, I have to think that, you know, in the case of my daughter's teacher, Obviously, he's never said this, so it's just my hypothesis that he became a teacher to fulfill whatever weird obsessions that he had with little kids. I mean, truly, that's, I think some people are getting into the job to be predators. It's frustrating. I don't think everyone is because I'm a teacher myself and I don't want teachers to be attacked because they're not all bad. <laughs> Walter says there are ways for parents to keep up with suspicious activity. I think the first thing is, you know, when I was reading about this teacher, I'd want to know when she sent those pictures. Um, if she sent them while she was at the school, my guess is she was connected to the school server. At least I'm a former teacher. And when I was using, you know, my phone on campus, I was connected um, to the school's server. Additionally, even with my own daughter, her teacher was receiving and buying child porn while on the school server. That is hugely problematic. So I'd want to know that. How are these school servers being governed? Who's looking over them? Because if she is sending pictures like that or getting onto inappropriate websites, that really should be a flag for the school because you are using your place of employment to do that. And that in and of itself is illegal. I think the other thing too is when we look, as you mentioned, at background checks, of course felonies are going to be on their records and all of that will come up. And that's going to preclude someone from being hired, at least I would hope. The problem is, is with background checks is they're, for the most part, for teaching, done at that surface level, right? It's a fingerprint. So they're checking to see if you have outstanding warrants, if you have felony convictions, those kinds of things. Um, they are not necessarily looking through someone's social media or, or social background. Walter believes a teacher's social media presence is key in learning more about their personal life and whether they could commit such a crime. And I actually think that that is probably the more predictive indicator, in my opinion, um, because a lot of these folks who are being arrested for this, this teacher included, don't have a past or, well, may have, but don't have a documented past of engaging in this behavior. And so I think that piece, um, and I know it's somewhat controversial, but I do think if you are undergoing a background check, you should have to make your social media public for them to look at that. I know I've had background checks where I've had to do that before. It can be. It can be cumbersome, it can take a while, um, and it can cost more money, but I do think it might help um, weed out some of this, this behavior. Let's say that the district actually does require this to show your Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. What sort of things would they be looking for that would make them not wanna hire this person? So it's less of sort of a glaring issue, and in my opinion, more of a judgment issue. What is your judgment about the things that you post? Um, you know, for example, I, I have not looked at this individual's um, social media, but with my daughter's teacher, he was constantly posting about how much he hated his job, and you know, I I find that to be inappropriate. I don't use my social media as a way to vent any grievances about my job. That's very poor judgment, in my opinion, and is an indicator of kind of how you will be in class. Pictures of him partying, drinking. Teachers are allowed to drink. I mean, I, I drank when I was a teacher. However, I don't post gratuitous partying pictures um, on my social media um, because I know that people might look at that and that is an exercise in 
poor judgment, in my opinion, particularly when you're in a position like that. So I think it's little things like that, that in my opinion are tip offs to poor judgment. Walter is particularly passionate about cases like these, whether the teachers are accused of sexual or physical abuse. She says it stems from a personal experience involving her daughter. Her teacher pushed her extremely hard off of a swing, um, didn't report that incident. Um, when I picked her up, called her a drama queen, um, she was screaming and her arm was broken in three places. Um, and then he lied about it to Child Protective Services. And that was my first red flag. Because the thing is, I'm a teacher. Accidents have absolutely happened in my classroom. Kids do break bones. Like, it happens. And I think had he just been honest, um, this would have maybe not taken on the life that it did. So Child Protective Services was called, turned into a whole big thing. Um, I was told by the school to sort of leave it alone. Um, I was scared of you know, losing my job and her losing her opportunity to go there. There's so many things that your brain kind of goes through um, about that. Walter stayed on as a teacher at that school for a while, but noted the problematic environment when she reported the issues. I brought all these issues to the school, asked that this teacher be fired uh, for obvious issues, and they refused to and basically said that I was, you know, the problem. <laughs> And I shouldn't have made such a big, big deal about it. But I think upon reflecting, a lot of it is the culture of the school. How does the school treat instances like this? And I think they hope that it will just go away because it's a private school, right? They don't want that behavior, I guess. Um, but it really culminated in me leaving. After Walder resigned, her daughter's former teacher, Jason Baldwin, was arrested for purchasing child pornography while using the school's server. I think the school created a culture in which uh, abuse was accepted <laughs> and pervasive. Um, and then on August 1st, 2020, I had already left by that point. Um, that teacher was let out in handcuffs um, uh, for receiving and purchasing child pornography on the school campus. Um, and then he was indicted on five counts. Um, each count brings about a 20 year sentence ish, um, but he actually pled, he pled guilty to just one um, and got 20 years. So he got the full count of one um, and he began his sentence about two years ago in a federal correction facility here in um, Dallas. So he's been convicted. Walter says the culture of the school district is imperative when protecting your children. I think the first thing, and I've, you know, I guess learned this the hard way, I don't know, but I'm trying to make it into something good, is to know the culture of that school. Ask the school in writing, everything needs to be in writing, what their procedures are for the reporting of child abuse at their school. What does the hierarchy look like? What is the expectation of teachers? How is a report handled um, once it's filed? Ask for all of that, because a lot of schools are not transparent. In my, in my decade of working at that school, we never had one kind of professional development on child abuse. But when I worked in public school, we did. So it was very clear. At that school, it wasn't clear. Maybe it's changed. I don't know. Um, but I do think that we need to have blanket federal policies that also apply to private schools just as much as they apply to public schools because we're still dealing with minors, right? And so there needs to be something across the board. And I think it's really important to get your schools um, procedures in writing. She also suggests keeping tabs on the adults who interact with your kids. I Google every single person that comes into my child's life. That includes her teachers. That includes her principal. That includes her counselors. That includes her dance and tennis coaches. I don't care. Um, and I don't trust people because of, you know, what's happened to us. If people are offended by that, I'm sorry, but I am going to Google you. I am going to try to friend you on social media because I do want to know everything about you. And so some schools have policies against friending teachers on social media, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but I do think that if they don't, it's something to think about. Swinkowski's case is just one of many we've covered here at Long Crime Network, where an adult in a position of power sexually abuses a child. Just this week, we reported on the case of Michelle Solis out of California a married mother of two who's accused of having a sexual relationship with a former student and sending explicit photos to him. There's also the case of Missouri teacher Ricky Lynn Laughlin, who's charged with attempted rape. 
Prosecutors say she invited a young student to have sex with her while her husband was out of the house. In Ohio, social worker Peyton Shires is accused of having sex with a 13-year-old boy she was counseling. Investigators eventually found videos of the pair having sex before she was arrested. There's also the case of Alyssa McCommon, the Tennessee teacher who prosecutors say is pregnant with her former student's child. She's accused of raping the boy in her own home. In Iowa, one-time teacher Cassidy Krause is accused of having sexual relations with at least three students. There's also the case of Stephanie Neepling, a former University of Arkansas employee who admitted she had sex with a 15-year-old. She's since been sentenced to six years of probation. Why do we keep seeing cases like this? So I think there's a couple different reasons, and it's not just it's not just females, right? It's males too. It's, it's lots of teachers. There's a couple reasons. Well, the first one is the law. It has a really kind of bad name, but it's called taking out the trash, and not a lot of states have it. Only five states have it. And basically what it means is if a teacher is terminated um, for, from a school for things of this nature, right? Sending text messages, those kinds of things, um, that trash information is sometimes not passed on um, to another school because it's illegal to report that. Um, and that is a huge problem, in my opinion, because a lot of these folks have engaged in that kind of behavior at schools they worked in in the past. And I would imagine a school wouldn't hire them if they knew that. I mean, I'm just assuming. So I think that's sort of problem number one. Another common thread among the cases we've covered, taking sexually explicit photos or videos. And this is also something I've seen in a lot of the cases that I've covered too. They're leaving evidence here. I mean, they're taking these photos and then sending them out. Is it possible that these people just think they're not going to get caught? Yes. I think in short, yes. I think that that is the short answer to your question. Because I think there's an assumption that if a child has a cell phone, the parents are probably monitoring that cell phone, right? I think in this day and age, we can probably assume that. Maybe not. Um, and maybe she really and truly thought, I think this was a 16-year-old that she was sending them to, that the parents were not... Um, monitoring any of that. But the reality is, is even if the parents weren't, um, and I don't blame them at all in this case, but even if they weren't, that kid is still probably going to take those explicit photos and send them to other people. And then that's going to get sent to other people. And that's good. So I'm not too sure what she thought her end game, end game would be um, in this situation. But yeah, she was absolutely going to get caught. In the case of Swinkowski, a student found out that she allegedly sent inappropriate photos to another student. They came forward to the principal and Swinkowski later resigned and turned herself over to police. But Walder says she could have turned herself in before that. Look, it might help her in terms of being cooperative, right? Um, maybe she's going to get a sense of probation or something like that. I, I don't know. Um, but... I think the fact that she's cooperative, it will help in her favor, but not too much in her favor, because the reality is, is that the investigation was already going on. It probably would have been more helpful if before the investigation was going on, she said, look, I did something really stupid. I wanna turn myself in before you even start an investigation. That would have been more helpful. Swinkowski now faces charges of enticement of a child and child exploitation. She was booked into a Mississippi jail on November 13th, but has since been released on $50,000 bond. Reporting for Long Crime Network, I'm Sierra Gillespie.